Hey folks, before we start, just want to say a really quick thank you to Squarespace, who are sponsoring this video. She's everyone's favourite Betazoid, and she's actually just a little bit deadly. She's Deanna Troy, and today we're going to go through all these cool little tidbits about her. But before we watch this video, make sure that you check out the original article by the wonderful Jack Kiley. Yous are stunning, yous are wonderful. I'm Sean Ferrick for Trek Culture, and here are 10 things you didn't know about Deanna Troy. Well, that's a big one! Hey, I'm Rise's most badass meteorologist, Chuck Tarka, and I am totally stoked to bring you this rad offer. I recently set up a website using Squarespace to share some bodacious photos of rare weather phenomena. Check out this sick photo of an Andorian aurora borealis. Ball lightning on Kronos. It's like Kalos himself like totally graced me with his stoke presence. Also, these really sweet clouds on Shakari. I just really like them. Using Squarespace, I was able to set up email campaigns to keep you guys up to date with my photography trips, getting members content for the coolest bros to support my endeavors. We got an inventory manager lets me know when to print fresh photos for you. Audience insights lets me ride that content away and keep you guys inundated with stoke. I can add my social media, share all my photos with you there too. Come on guys, head over to squarespace.com forward slash trekcoach and you get 10% off your first purchase and a free trial. Squarespace.com forward slash trekcoach. Don't be a square man, go to Squarespace. Live long and party on! Number 10, the role first went to Denise Crosby. Before filming began on Star Trek The Next Generation, the producers were set on casting Denise Crosby in the role of Deanna Troy, and at the same time, Marina Sirtis was reading for the part of Masha Hernandez, who later became Natasha Yar. Crosby admitted that she had difficulties with her fit for the role, not quite grasping, as she once stated, the gobbledygook and weird concept of a Betazoid. It was Gene Roddenberry who eventually swapped the roles. It was decided that Sirtis was a better fit for the part of the empathic Troy. In Crosby's words, citing Roddenberry, however, she, the actress, was just this kind of American gold girl compared to the more exotic otherworldly element that was wanted for Troy. In any case, the switch happened not a moment too soon. When Sirtis got the call confirming she got the part, her US visa was due to expire that very day. The actress was packing her bags, a little dejected, for a return to her hometown of London. Thankfully, the rest is history. Had Roddenberry not changed things, perhaps Troy, and not Yar, would have met her end at the hands, gloopy pseudo appendages, of the grumpy old prankbait Armus. Number 9. Character Constructs not a total recall. What you may not know is that the character of Troy first took reference from prior Trek, and Ilea in particular from the motion picture. Think Deltons and Beta Zoids and their mental capabilities. The latter was already a carryover from the abandoned project Star Trek Phase 2. Ilea's relationship with Will Decker was then the model to build that between Troy and Riker. Both Marina Sirtis and Denise Crosby also originally considered Troy to be Spock-like. The character description for Troy in the TNG season Bible does make passing reference to Spock, but this is merely to flesh out the counsellor's telepathic abilities. Troy was ultimately meant to be her own person, her role nonetheless second in importance only to the captain and first officer, according to the series Bible once more. There seems to be some confusion surrounding the original intent for the character, however. Between conflicting descriptions of Roddenberry calling Troy both the brain on the show and sexy and not very bright, it is difficult to know what to think. Apparently Roddenberry initially wanted Troy to have three, or even four depending on the source, breasts, before DC Fontana thankfully convinced him otherwise. Sirtis would later note that, with the costume changes of season 1, when Troy got cleavage she lost her brain matter, then only really gained some back when she regained the uniform. Number 8. She nearly didn't make it past season 1 of TNG. Given the pandemonium behind the scenes, it is a wonder anyone made it past the first season of TNG. We all know what happened to Natasha Yard, Denise Crosby, and Dr. Crusher Gates McFadden. What you probably didn't know, however, is that it was Troy who was originally on the chopping block. Several fairly significant changes had already been made to the character between the pilot and the rest of the season. The extent of Troy's powers was reduced with regards to her telepathic capabilities, and she also changed outfit and hairstyle. No longer was she dressed in that god-awful cosmic cheerleader uniform with the ugliest go-go boots ever designed. 
mind, as Marina Sirtis herself famously described it. The writer struggled with the character and empathic abilities. According to Sirtis, she was often simply written out of scenes where Troy's presence could have been problematic for the plot. As Captain Jemia once said, what I wouldn't give for a Betazoid right now. This led the writers to consider nixing the character before the end of the first season. It was only with the departure of Crosby and McFadden from the show that Troy was given leave to remain. Sirtis found this out straight from the horse's mouth at Jonathan Frakes' wedding during the break between seasons when Jean Roddenberry approached her to announce that the first episode of season two would focus on Troy. Number seven, Marina Sirtis hated all that chocolate. In TNG at least, Troy seemed to accumulate a lot of serious and dark scenes, some of which we've already discussed. She loses her empathic powers, is rapidly aged by a malicious alien ambassador, has her body taken over by a criminal imposter, is transformed into an amphibian, must do the acting job of her life aboard a Romulan starship, and that's not to mention having to negotiate the difficult relationship she has with her mother. Of course, her role as counsellor requires her to be more earnest than most, but there are lighter moments for Troy. One now famous example is her adoration and borderline addiction to chocolate. Well, it is a galaxy-class starship. Sorry. In the episode The Game, Riker finds Troy tucking into a bowl of chocolate upon chocolate upon chocolate. She proceeds to explain to him, in the minutest of detail, the fine art of the confectionery's consumption. Remember, it's the whole experience. What you may not know, however, is far from never having met a chocolate she didn't like, was that Marina Sirtis hated having to eat it. Contrary to the popular belief, the actress does like chocolate, but eating that much take after take would be too much for anybody. Apparently, she would ask the crew to use a type of chocolate she didn't like, and then she would spit out what she ate into a bucket. Number six, her changing accent has an origin story. The original casting call for Troy, not without a few uncomfortable of the time aftertastes and cliches and all its pan-European vagueness, states that Diana is probably foreign, anywhere from Italian, Greek, Hungarian, Russian, Icelandic, etc., with looks and accent to match. Marina Sirtis, who was born in London, east and then moved north, to Greek parents, is fluent in Greek, is skilled at accents, and was tasked at creating a Betazoid one for Troy. She opted for a mixture of Eastern European and what she drew from the accent of an Israeli friend. Problem with this is that when we met Troy's Betazoid mother, Loxana, she sounded, for want of a more precise description, American. Sirtis was then told that Diana got her accent from her father, but when we meet him, he also sounds generic American. The actor hails from Texas, so that didn't fit either. Understandably a bit frustrated, Sirtis eventually just switched to something more mid-Atlantic as the series and films progressed, at times closer to her native North London, and at other times more American. The actress stated that if she could change one thing about her time on TNG, I wouldn't give Diana a foreign accent, even though her mother is a Betazoid. Number five, she might have married Riker in season seven of TNG. All good things must come to an end, naked on Beta Z, or it could very well have turned out this way before the series finale. In the actual season 7, we got to see a relationship between Troy and Worf, but it was all a bit weird and never really went anywhere as Worf was transferred to Deep Space Nine. The two were married with kids in a parallel universe that Prime Worf stumbles into, and Troy even killed Worf in an empathic hallucination that mirrored events which took place when the Enterprise D was under construction. In an interview, Marina Sirtis shared her views on the relationship. I didn't like the fact that he totally became unclingon like when he was with Troy. I liked better the relationship he had with Dax over on Deep Space Nine. Furthermore, she felt that Troy Riker made a much better couple, and I think we can all agree with that. In fact, the idea of the pair tying the knot in TNG's final season was popular among the writers until producers Rick Berman and Michael Piller phased the suggestion down in flames. Perhaps Riker wasn't emotionally ready enough to be parted with his beard at that stage. To paraphrase the Beatles, all you need is metaphasic radiation. Number four, Marina Sirtis was directed by Jonathan Frakes in an episode of The Orville. Seth MacFarlane's The Orville is a great piece of science fiction in its own right. Season four, anyone please? MacFarlane makes no secret of his love for Star Trek as a source of inspiration. He even appeared in Enterprise, and there was that hilarious episode of Family Guy when the next generation cast. These aren't Star Trek questions, what the hell? Many veteran Star Trek writers and producers, such as Brandon Braga, Joe Minoski, and David A. Goodman have worked on The Orville, and Jonathan Frakes has called his show Star Trek with Comedy. Marina Sirtis has appeared in The Orville's second season episode, Sanctuary, in the role of a shipboard school teacher, directed by Jonathan Frakes. It was hard not to see a bit of TNG reunion for the pair, or even for the quasi-return of Troy in a different guise. Sirtis said of the experience, just being on the Orville, everything looks like the next generation. It was almost like stepping back in time with Jonathan directing. Frakes has also likened the directing style of the Orville to that of the TNG. In this standout episode of the program, the parallels are evident, and Sirtis, as school teacher, plays a counselling role to the young Mocklin Topa and parents Bortus and Clyden. Number three, we don't know much about Picard season three, but Troy will be in it a lot. 
Now, warning, these are very possible spoilers ahead. Troy was often sidelined in The Next Generation as the Captain There Hiding Something character. Worse, in the films, Sirtis was relegated to an almost bit part role. The actress has admitted that she was often decorative, but was ultimately fine with that, wishing nonetheless that she had suggested more storylines, particularly between other women, for Troy to the writers. In an interview for the Blu ray release of the films, Sirtis also laments that she tried and failed to make Troy funny during TNG's run to the point where she even asked her agent only to find her dramatic roles after the series' end. Fortunately, she was delighted with the now legendary drunk scene in First Contact and changed her mind about doing comedy. What can we say? With the limited amount of information that we have is that Troy will be a big part to play in the third and final season of Star Trek Picard. In the words of Sirtis herself during a red carpet news interview, we are in it, we are in it, a lot. The actress has also stated that, having felt discarded by Nemesis, the cast was cherished on Picard. And whilst executive producer Terry Metalis has ominously warned us that the safety of the characters is not guaranteed in season three, Sirtis said she would gladly return to the role in another spin-off. Death of a character is certainly no hindrance in any case, especially with the multiple time periods of the shows. And temporal investigations has just arrived. Number two, Marina Sirtis had a few mishaps on set. The character of Deanna Troy was accustomed to witnessing disaster, destruction and injury. After all, she did, under orders, fly the Enterprise E at full impulse into the scimitar. She also unexpectedly found herself in command in an episode quite literally called Disaster. The woman behind the role, Marina Sirtis, equally had a couple of noteworthy accidents on set which you might not be aware of. One on-set mishap befell Sirtis during the filming of Generations. During the battle scene with the Klingons, consoles were blowing up left and right. When Troy goes to replace an injured officer at the con, Sirtis actually sat on a piece of degree from the explosion and burnt her bottom. Thankfully, she wasn't badly hurt. Another such incident occurred during the filming of the Next Generation episode Power Play. In a scene on the surface of the planet, O'Brien, Riker, Data and Troy are thrown violently backwards by an EM discharge just before they could be beamed back onto the ship. Whilst the other three actors had stunt doubles perform this for them, Sierra just wanted to do the stunt herself, with the encouragement of the director. She committed to it so much that, when she landed on her back, she damaged her coccyx and was in pain for months. Fair play to her. A couple of rounds of Frere Jacques won't make you forget that. Number one, she has appeared in five series, four films, and on a stamp. One of the most prolific characters of the franchise, Marina Sirtis starred as Troy in The Next Generation and has appeared in Voyager, Lower Decks, Picard, and Enterprise. Whatever your thoughts on that last one, it still counts. She is beaten only by Jonathan Frakes as Riker in that regard, who also appeared in the episode Defiant of DS9. Sirtis is the only woman to appear as the same character in as many series. However, she is among great company as one of only six actors to appear in two series finales. We'll let you figure that one out for yourselves. Troy was, of course, in each of the TNG movies. A recent highlight, aside from Picard, are her appearances in Lower Decks, where she is often the foil for the bombastic Riker. What you may also not know, unless you are already a fabulously fidelious philatist, is that Deanna Troy is one of the 18 characters, including the likes of Janeway, Kirk, Picard, Sisko, Archer, Spock, Reed, Burnham, to have been commemorated on a set of UK first-class postage stamps in November 2020 as a celebration of Star Trek. You'd be mad to post them, of course, but it would make for some epic snail mail. That's everything for our list today, folks. If there's anything else that we missed, let us know in the comments below. And again, thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to head to www.squarespace.com forward slash Trek culture for a free trial and 10% off your first purchase. Thank you so much for watching. And of course, don't forget to check out Jack's original article over on whatculture.com. You can catch us on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch us on Instagram at Trek Culture YT. Catch myself at Sean Ferrick on Twitter, at Sean.Ferrick88 on Instagram, and at Sean Ferrick on Hive. Look after yourselves. I'm talking to you again. Make sure that you live long and prosper. Have a wonderful few days. Make it so.